Stuck on what to give your friends and family this year? Wish them a merry softness and a happy new rear with newly comfy underwear, loungewear, and pajamas from Tommy John. When your loved ones start their day wearing Tommy John, they're that much more comfortable so they can do everything better. Tommy John loungewear's luxuriously soft tri-blend and micromodal fabrics mean four-way stretch and no lint balls of fuzz. With over 17 million pairs sold, giving the gift of Tommy John underwear and loungewear has become a holiday tradition for families all across the country. 97% of women and men love getting a gift from Tommy John. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. I don't usually talk about my underwear with strangers, but whatever they do to their undergarments is freaking magic because these things are beyond comfortable. I honestly don't wear anything else. You should get a pair for yourself or your loved ones as soon as possible. Returns and exchanges are free, and it's all backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee. So get 20% off your first order right now at TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. That's TommyJohn.com slash Cohen for 25% off. Order now so your gifts arrive before the holidays. TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. See site for details. Every holiday season, it's the same thing. My kids want the latest Instaphone, the cool new play box with Kung Fu grip, and a dozen other things I could barely pronounce or f***ing afford. It's enough to make you crazy. Well, not anymore. Why spend a fortune on consumer electronics when you could subscribe to Grover.com and get the latest gear and gadgets for a fraction of the price? Grover is a subscription service that allows you to rent consumer electronics flexibly for a low monthly price. Grover offers phones, drones, laptops, gaming equipment, cameras, and more. And the best part is, Grover has your back covering up to 90% of the repair and damage costs of the device. It's like Netflix or Spotify, but for electronics and subscribing is really f***ing easy. So go to grover.com slash culpa. First, browse and search for the tech you want. Second, select how many months you'd like to rent. And finally, Grover offers one, three, six, or 12 month subscription plans. Place an order and make your first monthly payment. It's just that easy. You like Apple, folks? Well, how do you like these apples? Grover's prices are insane. iPhones starting at $44, MacBooks for under 50, a Nintendo for less than $15 a month, or AirPods for $12.90, smart speakers for $7, so you can listen to my show in every room of your house. With Grover, you can subscribe to hundreds of products from your favorite brands like Apple, Samsung, Bose, Dell, Razer, Garmin, and many others by visiting grover.com slash mea culpa. Grover's circular model contributes to the reduction of e-waste by reusing their electronics across multiple life cycles. And there's a big deal, folks, so don't be a schmuck. Only a Trump would pay full price for consumer electronics when all you need to do is subscribe and save serious money. So sign up for Grover right now and get 10% off each month you rent on any item in the store. That's 10% off when you use promo code MEACULPA at checkout. That's Grover.com slash MEACULPA. Grover.com slash MEACULPA. Go there now. This is Michael Cohen, and you're listening to the best of Mea Culpa. I hope you are enjoying a well-deserved break from the chaos of this past year and have some downtime over the holidays. While you're sitting on the beach or working in your garage, take some time to catch up on old episodes of Mea Culpa. You'll be amazed at how much has stayed exactly the same. And thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here with all new episodes starting on January 6th. Yeah, it's January 6th. Can you believe it? So without further ado, please enjoy this encore presentation of our January 29th, 2021 interview with The View's Joy Behar. This is my
This is Michael Cohen, and you're listening to the Mea Culpa Week in Review. I wanted to ask you about Marjorie Taylor Greene. How concerned are you about her past posts, remarks, rhetoric? Um, what would you like to see done about her? What I'm concerned about is the Republican leadership in the House of Representatives who is willing to overlook, ignore uh, those uh, statements, uh, assigning her to the Education Committee when she has mocked the killing of little children at Sandy Hook Elementary School, when she has mocked the killing of teenagers in high school at the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School, what could they be thinking or is thinking too generous a word for what they might be doing? It's absolutely appalling. And I think that the focus has to be on the Republican leadership of this House of Representatives for the disregard they have for the death of those children. As President Biden finishes his first full week in the White House, a palpable sense of relief has settled across Washington as the White House now returns to a place of normalcy. We also witnessed the deliberate and forceful rejection of Donald Trump's legacy in a record and stunning 17 executive orders, which undid most of Trump's divisive legislation in a single stroke, proving that once again, the pen is mightier than the sword. Or for that matter, Trump's Twitter feed. President Biden has ended a ban on transgender people in the military. Mr. Biden signed an executive order yesterday reversing a policy ordered by then President Trump. President Joe Biden plans on making the switch to electric vehicles, replacing the government's current vehicle fleet. The White House has added a sign language interpreter to its news briefings. As Press Secretary Jen Psaki says an American sign language interpreter will be a regular part of daily press briefings during the Biden administration. The Treasury Department will resume its efforts to put former slave and abolitionist Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. The plan to replace Andrew Jackson on the 20 was originally announced during the Obama administration, but President Trump delayed that project. The new cycle has even begun to take on a cadence of a pre-Trumpian existence. As without access to Twitter, Donald Trump can no longer set the news agenda for the day. For the past four years, it wasn't America's newsroom, but rather Donald Trump's who was dictating what we talked about on a daily basis. His thumbs created a warped 24-7 sprint with a cascade of breaking news that divided the day into a series of interlocking crises. We are just getting started. Believe me. 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 Now banned from his preferred method of communication, Donald Trump seems to have vanished from public life. Without the ability to either induce or channel rage, people have simply moved on. For as tumultuous and chaotic as the last four years have been, without Twitter, Trump's last few days have actually been among the quietest of his presidency. That said, we must contend with the wackos left behind by Donald Trump. Every time I sigh with relief that Trump has left the building, I'm confronted by the reality that people like Marjorie Taylor Greene are allowed to hold elected office. Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, a QAnon supporter, she has repeatedly indicated support for executing prominent Democratic politicians. 2019, she liked a comment that said, quote, a bullet to the head would be quicker to remove House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. In 2018, she said, quote, the stage is being set after someone asked whether they could hang President Obama and Hillary Clinton. On Tuesday, CNN's K-File revealed a slew of disturbing and fucking downright insane Facebook messages showing the Georgia Congresswoman's support for assassinating House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and executing FBI agents who, in her eyes, were part of the deep state working against Trump. This is in addition to Green's myriad of posts supporting various QAnon conspiracies and her support of theories that cast the Sandy Hook shooting as a stage event by so-called crisis actors. There's even video of her accosting Parkland shooting survivor, David Hogg. He's got nothing to say. Sad. He has nothing to say because there really isn't anything to say, you guys. He has nothing to say because he's paid to do this. Guess what? I'm a gun owner. I'm an American citizen. And I have nothing but this guy with his George Soros funding and his major liberal funding has got everything. I want you to think about that. That's where we are. 
and he's a coward. He can't say one word because he can't defend his stance. Impeacher in chief and Republican House leader Kevin McCarthy vowed that he would have a conversation with Green in light of the disturbing revelations. Which in code word for, I'm not going to do a fucking thing because she's a popular representative with a massive grassroots base of a nutnag conspiracists. McCarthy spent the past four years siding up to Donald Trump, who referred to him as Mike Kevin, which itself sounds like the name of some creepy 80s after school special about a man who lures kids into his van. So the only thing I would ask of you in a press, these are new members. Give them an opportunity before you claim what you believe they have done and what they will do. Seriously, though, Marjorie Taylor Greene and the equally demented Colorado representative Lori Boebert are part of a new breed of politician for whom Trump remains the messiah. They have created themselves in his shameless, norm-busting mold, and they follow his same incendiary Twitter presence. Boebert, who owns a gun-themed barbecue restaurant called Shooters in Gunnison, Colorado, has fashioned herself as the right-wing answer to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm a newly elected congresswoman from Colorado. Even though I now work in one of the most liberal cities in America, I refuse to give up my rights, especially my Second Amendment rights. I will carry my firearm in D.C. and in Congress. Unfortunately for the GOP, She's fucking insane, above and beyond even Donald Trump, and is being pressured to resign under suspicion she's not only supported the January 6th riot, but gave tours to militia members in the days leading up to the insurrection. Her actions are disgraceful. Uh, There's no doubt that she was part of inciting the riot and the insurrection. And I'm looking at uh, what tools are available uh, to condemn that. Um, It it is possible that I want her to leave Congress. I don't think that there are, there's a place uh, for uh, people of, of her immorality uh, and, and depravity uh, to be in the United States Congress, uh, whether or not um, that's, that's, uh, there's a tool at our disposal uh, to do that, uh, I, I guess, remains to be seen, and we're doing that analysis right now. In reality, she is a nasty holdover, a lingering cough like Marjorie Taylor Greene from the previous manga era. Can't we all now say no? Your opinion and your thoughts are not fucking valid? You appeal to the worst of our nature. Your supporters are the angry mob, the conspiracists, racists, and lunatics who help perpetuate the January 6th riots. If they don't fix this shit, we're gonna fucking this this one fucking day? Millions of Americans are out! To protect the Constitution of the United States against enemies foreign and domestic! There are not two sides, not alternate facts, or whatever it is that you want to say in defense of yourself. Just fucking leave, please. You won't. I know that because Trump created the mold from which you hatched, and until we deal with the disease of Trumpism, there will only be more of you. That said, we're all watching. Midas Touch is watching. The Lincoln Project is watching. And they are going to target you with the most sophisticated digital mud bath in the history of politics. You will soon be viral chum, reduced to a meme and laughed at by history. Trying to wrangle this fractious mob of lunatics into some semblance of order is Kevin McCarthy, another GOP loser who stands for nothing beyond the consolidation of his own power. People like fucking McCarthy are almost worse than Donald Trump. Strike that. They are much fucking worse than Donald Trump. At least with Trump, you knew that you were dealing with a corrupt and soulless scumbag of the highest order. But these guys, time and again, allowed him to operate and avoid accountability. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Thank you, sir. May I have another? Even now, after Trump is gone, he's reaching up from his political grave and exerting influence upon the GOP. On Monday, the Senate received the articles of impeachment against the former President Trump, and it became readily apparent that much of the GOP remains frightened of Trump and the influence of his MAGA followers. Led by Rand Paul, there was a move to immediately dismiss the charges against Donald Trump on the grounds that impeaching a former president 
believe this shit is unconstitutional. And I won't be cowed by people saying, oh, you're a liar. That's the problem with the media today is they say all Republicans are liars and everything we say is a lie. There are two sides to every story. Interview somebody on the other side, but don't insert yourself into the story to say we're all liars because we there, some fraud there, in the election. They're not, they're not. Well, it's not. First of all, Trump was president when he was impeached. His trial is merely after the fact, and it will have profound ramifications on how we hold our leaders accountable. To let him off the hook is to literally whitewash the entire January 6th riot as if it never happened. A clear majority of House Republicans who are now uh, kind of braying about unity voted to overturn the election uh, and in effect make Trump president for four more years over the will of the voters. Marco Rubio is a subspecies of the GOP that is perhaps worse than Rand Paul. He wants to be able to condemn Trump's incitement of the riot while stating that a trial would be bad for the country. He is threading the thinnest of political needles at the moment with his stance which allows him to occupy the moral high ground in rejecting violence while not totally alienating more reasonable MAGA voters. Yeah, the first chance I get to vote to end this trial, I'll do it because I think it's really bad for America. If you want to hold people accountable, there's other ways to do it, particularly for president including, as I said, the perspective of history and, and even now as people are learning more about all this. But it's really bad. When you talk about situations like this, this is, this is not a criminal justice trial. This is a political process. And ultimately, it is a political process that's going to inject things into our public discourse, into our debates. That's going to make it harder to get important things done. And it's just going to continue to fuel uh, these divisions that have paralyzed the country and, and have turned us into a country of people that hate each other. In my mind, it simply screams appeasement. There's no middle ground here. Either you stand against Donald Trump and hold him accountable, or you find some way to excuse his behavior. Rubio doesn't have the balls to do either. So, like many current GOP senators, he stands in the middle in some moral void where he can avoid alienating what's left of his own base. I would watch your back on that, Marco, because fucking Ivanka wants your seat. <laughs> this week, also marked the end of Mike Lindell's 15 minutes in the spotlight. The creepy Mike Pillow founder and noted crack cocaine enthusiast was finally banned from Twitter for his repeated violations of the platform's guidelines. And then a week ago, they did a Dominion, went online, went on TV and, and said they were going to go after Mike Lindell. Well, they did. They hired hit groups and bots and trolls, went after all my vendors, all these box stores to cancel me out. This cancer culture. Twitter made its decision based on a new policy it enacted after the Capitol insurrection, whereby people who repeatedly share election misinformation can be permanently banned. Lindell has continued to insist that the January 6th storming of the Capitol was actually a peaceful protest until Antifa infiltrators started causing the mayhem, all in an effort to tarnish the outgoing president. This coupled with his vocal support of Stop the Steal made him a prime disseminator of false Trump propaganda. Funnily though, Lindell has made his My Pillow brand the betting of choice for MAGA followers and seems to have profited off the January 6th attacks. On the day of the riots, My Pillow was offering a discount code to its customers, Fight for Trump. Online shoppers who typed in the phrase could receive lower prices on the company's premium pillow, classic pillow, or other products. Such moves have caused retail outlets like Bed Bath & Beyond to remove Lindell's products from their stores. But My Pillow remains a major supporter of conservative media. According to the New York Times, in the first three quarters of 2020, My Pillow spent more than 62 million on television ads, nearly 99% of it going to cable channels such as Fox News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of My Pillow. My pillows not only give you a great night's rest, but they're also the only pillows that whisper conspiracy theories to you as you sleep. The election was stolen by China. Joe Biden's dog is a satanic pedophile. Nancy Pelosi will be the next bachelorette. The secret is my patented shriek capture technology. I put my head inside the pillow and scream into the microfibers until they absorb my ramblings. AOC stands for Antifa Operated Cyborg. The pillows are then quickly sewn shut and stuffed into plastic to seal in all my delusional juices. 
Thanks to my pillow, I'm both well rested and ready to commit sedition. Plus, enter the code Lizard People now and get 10% more paranoia. So, what are you waiting for? The revolution starts now. Take over, America! Get on my pillow and suffocate democracy today. A few episodes ago, I floated the term post traumatic Trump disorder. While facetious, It describes the clinical state of anxiety and trauma felt by countless individuals over the course of Donald Trump's presidency. That it now lingers when he is gone from our lives is what makes it truly a syndrome. I have spoken with friends who are dealing with children who were terrorized by January 6th and awake nightly in tears, worried that the Proud Boys or some of the MAGA offshoot will come for them in the dark. This terror, coupled with the slow, persistent dread many feel, even to this day, makes PTTD something truly pernicious. Most of you were passive victims and the trauma that lingers comes from having been powerless in the face of Trump's constant aggression and trespasses and intensified by the fact that he never faced any consequences. Now that he is gone and banned from Twitter, I believe for most of you, those feelings will fade. But for some of us, the trauma is more real and truly chronic. I think about the Capitol Police who bravely stood down a mob of MAGA rioters outnumbered at least 10 to 1. Many of them were beaten and some of them killed. There were reporters and photographers targeted by the mob as well. Many of them are now dealing with serious PTTD. I truly feel for them and urge everyone to not take these feelings lightly. Talk about them with your family. I'm talking about it now because what you're feeling is real and valid. And if you need help dealing with these feelings, don't wait. There isn't any shame. I spent nearly three months in solitary confinement, and there isn't a week that goes by that I don't think I'm right back there with my chest constricted and my heart beating like a drum. It's real, it's frightening, and it needs to be discussed because it's going to emerge months from now that more people are suffering from this based on the trauma Trump put us through as a nation. And now for the main event. My next guest on Maya Culpa has long been part of Barbara Walters' TV sisterhood on ABC's The View. For over 20 years, Joy Behar has been a staple in American homes and has interviewed presidents, first ladies, and countless pretenders to the throne. In the Donald Trump era, she has used her platform on The View to excoriate the former president and his family for their misdeeds and make certain that the show did not become an infomercial for MAGA propaganda. When they appeared, Behar spoke with me earlier in the week and on the heels of her fiery exchange with Meghan McCain which she discussed in great detail. She pulls no punches and doesn't take shit from anyone, least of all me. Stay tuned for an epic conversation with one of TV's great interrogators. And let's listen now to that conversation. On inauguration day, just before President Biden was sworn in, you watched Donald Trump depart the White House, as did many of us, via Marine One, and you wrote the following. I'm almost out of words to describe how I feel as Trump departs the White House for the very last time. It's not elation, funnily enough. Exhaustion? I'm curious what was going through your mind at that time as you watched him leave Washington and hopefully for the last time. Yeah. Well, first of all, we know it's not really the last time for this guy because he's like herpes, you know, it, it really just comes back. It never really goes away, herpes. And he's like that to me. So, but the day that that plane flew away was an exciting moment, I thought, but I was exhausted from talking about him and having to read about him and then having to engage with people about him and reading about Ivanka and that that that, that idiot sons of his. Uh, not Baron. I feel sorry for little Baron, I have to say. Let me just digress here for a second. Did you ever once see Trump touch that boy? Did you ever see him put his arm around that boy or say? No. Never. No. That alone should make people understand what a bad guy he was. Who does that? To, uh, just ignores their own child like that. 
terrible. Yeah, look, it, it's, so let's just go back to what was going through your mind at that time, because then I'm going to share with you my thoughts. You don't want me to digress. We're going to have a very short conversation if I can't digress. <laughs> well, I don't mind your digression, but we do got to get back to the question on what was going through your mind as you watched him leaving Washington. What, what was going through my mind, I think, is, well, we, we dodged this bullet. As I said on the show, it felt like <clears throat> like when you're walking in New York City and you feel like any minute now an air conditioner could fall on your head. And nine out of ten times, it does not. And this was one of those moments. You got past it and you said, oh, the air conditioner didn't fall on my head. It was like we had gotten out of something that would have been, um, I think, probably fatal. Fatal to the democracy we live in, fatal to the country. And I don't know that we would ever be able to get back to normal after four more years of this guy. So I felt relief. I felt exhaustion. I felt happy for a moment. And knowing not that forever, you know, to be happy because you know that Biden is going to have a lot to do and they're going to just, they're not going to work with him. They're going to obstruct. Mitch McConnell lives to obstruct. And so it's a mixed feeling, you know? You know, I remember when I was in Washington in 2016, watching as Obama was leaving the White House after, of course, graciously turning over the keys to Trump and to Melania um, as, you know, Bar as President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. I mean, with real honor and with real dignity, they left. They said goodbye to people. It was a real procession. I mean, it was over five minutes between the, the uh, starting of the engines to the time that the Marine One lifted off and took off for, I think at that time, it was like Andrews Air Force Base or something. Making content is an essential part of what I do to keep this show going. But it hasn't always been a seamless creative process. Much of my day involves keeping all of you up to date with what's happening politically. To do so, I'm creating memes, videos, and all manner of material for people to enjoy. Creating it takes hours and hours as I source the pictures and design the social assets. Or at least it used to. Ever since I found Canva Pro, I can design anything like a pro on any device. Canva Pro is a design platform that empowers you to create and share stunning content in just a few clicks. Designing with Canva Pro is amazingly fast and fun. Choose from thousands of templates that are easy to customize or start from scratch. Canva Pro has endless premium fonts, photos, videos, and so much more that add personality and edge to whatever you're designing. Their library of tools and imagery is endless with features even an old dude like me can use to create fantastic looking social content. Plus, no more paying for pictures, fonts, or filters. With Canva Pro, it's all one price. Designing together has never been easier, sharing, editing, and commenting in real time. Canva Pro helps you stay organized on the same page and on top of team projects. No more misplaced files or tedious back and forth. Plus, you and four teammates can unlock everything Canva Pro has to offer for just $12.99 a month. With Canva Pro's content planner, you'll save time planning, creating, and posting social media content too. Pause schedule posts and edit them at any time. So design like a pro with Canva Pro. Right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you use my promo code. So just go to canva.me slash Cohen to get your free 45-day extended trial. That's canva.me slash Cohen. Canva.me slash Cohen. It's where you got to go. I found it interesting that Trump's entire liftoff was like under 30 seconds. He got in, they shut the door, the whirly started going, the aircraft lifted off, and it just took straight off. It was almost like he was running away from Washington as quickly as he could. And he didn't get the fanfare that he was hoping. He tried to show that he was a, above it all, that he was dignified and that he was brave as he said goodbye to some of the reporters that were standing off to the left. But he looked to me, so pathetic as as a former president leaving almost with his head down in disgrace. Did you see the same thing? 
he did leave in disgrace, but I don't know if, if it was because he was running or if they were pushing him out. You know, the, the helicopter <laughs> pilot must have been, get, get him in here and let's get him out of here fast. That could be too. I don't know that it was his choice to be running so fast. I mean, he, they don't even want him in Mar-a-Lago. They're running, you know, an airplane is going by with some kind of a, a flag that says loser. And he has to see that. He's a mess. And now he's starting the MAGA, the MAGA um, party. How do you like that? That's assuming he's really going to even start it. You do know that Donald Trump talks a lot of shit. Um, and most of which, if not 99% of it, never really comes to fruition. It's always a grift. So, of course, he's going to start the MAGA party or the Patriot Party, as they're calling it, simply because that's how he's going to keep his MAGA supporters paying money into this grift. And he needs the money. Rest assured that he truly does need. I know. It's also a good way to send a signal to the Republican senators who are going to be voting on conviction in the impeachment trial to not vote for conviction uh, as under threat that he will start a third party and they'll be out of work because there's nothing that these guys fear more than being out of work. It's fascinating to watch. I've lost so many jobs in my day. I don't fear losing jobs. And yet they are hanging on to their position. I don't know what they're, what they're worried about going back to. I mean, Tom DeLay, wasn't he an exterminator? Maybe he didn't want to go back to that job. People like that. I don't know what they do if they what they do if they were not in Congress. What do you know anything about that? Yeah, they would probably be collecting unemployment because very few of the GOP that I saw and that I had had an opportunity to meet impressed me for anything. If they were lawyers earlier in their career, they weren't um, lawyers that had incredible resumes or great great clients that obviously would have kept them from going into politics. You know, they may have come from good schools, but that's it. That's all that they had is a resume with the bullshit IV and the whole nine, nine yards, but they had nothing else. They were just basically empty suits. Right. But, you know, Joy, I believe that January 6th will be one of those moments like 9-11 and the assassination of JFK and other great national traumas that will remain with us for generations to come. Describe for me what you were doing when the rioters stormed the Capitol and how your day changed afterwards. This is like, you know, this is like being on a cop show where they go, where were you at that hour? Where were you between the hours of 12 and 4 on January 6th? I'm trying to remember where I was. Okay, I was watching it with my husband watching that, that entire thing and uh, in disbelief that these people actually would, could do something like this. And I couldn't believe the, the lack of security in the building. And how they, it, it just, how do you take, a, a, they, how do you just walk into the Capitol like that? It's unreal to me. And, and by the way, none of the senators and the Congress people in the building were aware that this could happen to them. You know, they were busy with their jobs. Nobody said, wow, I hope the, the police are watching us today because they were warned that this was going to happen. And nobody really was watching. It was, it was an incredible, uh, incredible experience to watch this. It felt a little bit, a little scary, like anybody can just do anything in this country, you know. Notice that on the inauguration, because they were warned that 25,000 National Guardsmen would be on the lookout, on the alert, they didn't show up. You notice that. So obviously they needed security there that day. And I don't know, somebody fucked up big. <laughs> well, I, I think inauguration was something different, simply because many of these organizations, and we've heard it from now the the shaman who was wearing like the Chewbacca outfit with oh, the yeah. bikini yeah. right? and the proud boys that they've now and the QAnon, many of the QAnon conspiracy theorists, they now believe that Donald Trump let them down I and know. that all of his prophecies <laughs> have basically fallen like all of his promises to the American people when he was running for election. All of his prophecies have basically fallen by the wayside that nothing that he was saying came to be true. So what was the point for them to take, you know, to take on the inauguration? And yes, knowing that this time the government was fully prepared for additional insurrection behavior. But I think that they would, would they, they're going to, they're going full throttle against the government with or without him. These people are not suddenly changing their minds. They may be annoyed with the leader, but that doesn't mean they've changed their philosophy. They're still out there, these people. Enormous numbers of them, the Q&A. We have them in the, in, the, in the Congress. Yes, but they may have not 
change their mind or change their ideology, but they don't have somebody that's blowing the dog whistle right. and getting them all inside, incited and, and ready to riot on his words. I mean, if you look to see what's happening now, they're all making allegations that, wait, wait, you can't arrest me for going into the Capitol. We were invited there by the president. Can you believe that shit? I mean, the fucking crazy thinking of these people that we were invited to storm and break the doors and the windows and yeah. deface the, the Capitol by our by the president of the United States. And yet Kevin McCarthy says everybody is responsible for this in the whole United States. Really? Really? I think it's it's one or two people we're talking about. And now we have Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and these other people who also encourage this. Rudy Giuliani. How happy are you today that um, uh, Dominion, uh, the people who make those uh, voting machines, are suing him for a billion dollars? I love that information. It's fabulous. It means that there's a crack. There's a crack. You know, and and what about the my pillow guy? They're pulling all of their their uh, equipment out of Bed and Beyond, Beyond my what is it called? Bed Bath Bed, and Beyond. Bed Bath and Beyond. And other companies are not going to sell that horrible pillow, which was like sleeping on cement anyway. Uh, I mean, I think that there there are cracks now coming. There are cracks, but I still say that these people are entrenched in their racist philosophy, in their anti-government stance, in the lies that they've been fed. You know. And um, and I'm I, I'm I'm you know something, Michael. Is there ever going to be a day where we don't have to talk about Donald Trump anymore? Yes. Yeah, so the answer is yes. And tell me if you feel the same way that I do. It's five days now since the inauguration, and I don't see the same chaos. I don't wait because I don't sleep much anyway. I'm up at four four thirty in the morning, and I go into the other room. I'll turn on the news. I'll turn on something to watch. Uh, as I'm reading, whether it's newspapers or paperwork that I'm doing. And I don't see the same chaos because Trump would wake up roughly the same time that I do. And he would just start with his fingers hitting his keyboard on his telephone with some crazy ass fucking tweet that would incite an already breaking news. Five minutes later, it's more breaking news. And then you would get 30 minutes later. It's even crazier breaking I know, but news. Good. We don't, but they didn't put him back. We don't Twitter. have that anymore, Joy. That's because we don't he's, have off that. Of, he's off of Twitter, Michael, but they're going to give it back to him and he'll find some other way. And then the news, the press dumps on it. Yes, but I don't think, and that's another thing. I don't think that his Twitter feed is going to be as relevant as before. Because, yeah, maybe the first day or two, people will start to interact with it since he's been off. But after a while, it's boring. He's boring. I agree with right? that. And, and the more that the media isn't focusing on him, the more that he goes away. Now, of course, he still has that 28% of his base but slowly but surely, as Joe Biden and Kamala Harris start bringing this country back together, unifying both Republican and Democrats, again, for the benefit of the American people, I truly believe that his influence and power over even a percentage of that 28 percent rock solid base of his, they're going to start to walk away from him simply because they're starting to see people like you and me and others showing the bullshit showing the, the the man behind the cloth, like in The Wizard of Oz, right? But we've been saying that for four years, and, and they still got... But, Joy, he's been the president of the United States. You're saying when he doesn't have the power and the authority, he loses his mojo, all right? Is that what you're saying? Yes. However, what people will also see is the power of government coming after the power that used to be government. And I'm talking about Cy Vance, the attorney, uh, the district attorney yeah. here in New York, or Tish James, our New York State Attorney General, and others starting to do what Dominion just did to Rudy Giuliani. They're going to make them pay I for so. all of their crimes. Oh, I guarantee it. I mean, I'm, I'm involved in it, and I can tell you that they will pay. You need accountability. Once there's accountability, I think that you're right. That will happen. People will start to, to see. But a lot of there's a lot of blowback to accountability. I hear a lot about unity all of a sudden, like the Democrats, all of a sudden it's on them to, to unify the country. Well, why don't the Republicans try to unify the country and admit that he's a liar, admit that he that he committed sedition, admitted that he encouraged uh, insurrection? Admit it. Admit, and how come? And you know what? What's disappointing is I always see like 82 percent of the Republican Party is still Trump supporters. What is the matter with these people? What is wrong with them? Was it not enough 
that he gra- who said it was okay to grab a woman by her uh, by her genitalia, or that he made fun of handicapped people, or that he locked up children at the border and took them away from their parents. Is, what was the point? Where was it in your head that you say to yourself, I am okay with this guy? To this day, I, I find that to be uh, remarkable. Hi, folks. Michael Cohen here. And we've got an amazing sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show. And that's pronounced har bin Jur. Things can get pretty intense discussing American politics. So if you need a break from the news cycle and want to hear incredible storytelling that is both fascinating and actionable, you have to check it out. The show covers a wide range of topics through weekly interviews with some real heavy-hitting guests. And there are a ton of episodes you'll find interesting since you're a fan of this show. I'd recommend you check out his recent conversation with former CIA director John Brennan as he discovers his life and times with the world's most powerful spy agency. I also listened to a recent Feedback Friday episode where Jordan talks with a woman married to a conspiracy theorist who doesn't know if she and her husband will believe in the same reality ever again. Trust me, it's fascinating stuff. There's an episode for everyone, though no matter what you're into, The show covers stories like how a professional art forger somehow made millions of dollars while being chased by both the feds and the mafia. Jordan's also done an episode all about birth control and how it can alter the partners we pick and how going on and off the pill can change elements of our personalities. The podcast covers a lot, but one constant is his ability to pull useful pieces of advice from his guests. I promise you, you'll find something useful that you can apply to your own life whether that's an actionable routine change that boosts your productivity or just a slight mindset tweak that changes how you see the world. I really enjoy this show, and I think that you will as well. So search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You know, moving forward, one of my greatest regrets is actually helping Donald Trump as he furthered his political agenda going back early to 2011. And yeah. then, of course, you know, because of The Apprentice, we pay, we bailed out in 2012, but then restarting it in 2015 for the 2016 election, you yeah. know, as he furthered his political agenda on the back of his made up birther conspiracy. Now, I, obviously, we all knew better that the birth of conspiracy was merely Donald Trump using um, the power of his social platform in order to rile up these groups of racists and these individuals that never wanted to see anyone of color. Obviously, forget about being the president, but where, even well, running for the you, presidency. Where, where were you at at that time? Where, where, where was in your head at that time during the birth of conspiracy? Well, I had many conversations with him, and my comment to him was, you know that this isn't true, that he was born in Hawaii. He's not born in Kenya. Everybody said that to him. And then what did he say to you back? Oh, his answer was very straightforward and clear. Do you not notice how much attention that we're getting? This is a great, this is a great, great, um, you know, theory. And many people are jumping onto it. And he goes, you know, I'm on the front page of the newspaper every single day. Let me ask you a personal question. At that point, why didn't you just quit? Why didn't you just say, fuck you, I'm out of here. I'm not a racist. I don't believe this. You're doing a very bad thing. Why, why didn't you just quit? Look, my, my wife, my daughter, my son, they wanted me to quit even before that. I, I didn't. Um, that was Donald Trump making his statement. I don't have an answer as to why. I guess for the same reason why everybody, for example, at ABC didn't quit regarding, you know, Les Moonves or why everyone in Hollywood doesn't quit simply because of Harvey Weinstein, right? I mean, he's my boss. His ideology and his beliefs were his own. Um, I didn't come out ever to make a different. statement no, that come on, I have it's, to take it's really that. it's really not. It's no, really no, no. not. You know, he was my boss. He's not my moral conscience. I, however, allowed my moral, you know, my my morals to go way down south, trying to keep up with his needs as my boss. And hindsight being 2020, I'm sorry I ever took the job from him. But, right. I, you know, just going back to this. Wait a minute. Les Moonves was at CBS. 
And apparently he was a sexual harasser. You don't always know that these people are doing that sort of thing. Donald Trump was right out there with this philosophy for you to hear. And, you know, the other thing, Michael, and I like you, I like you, but I feel that I want to have this conversation with you about where you were at at that time, because it makes me understand a little bit your transformation. I believe in redemption. And I, I believe that you and even Anthony Scaramucci is a friend of mine because you guys turned the page. But 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 at the time you were roughing you physically were not roughing anybody up. But I heard you threaten and be nasty to people. What happened? Who was that person? This that is not the person that I'm talking to right now. Yeah. Who was that? First of all, there's a lot of it is made up in terms of I saw um, you know, my yeah, you heard one tape with Tim Mack of Daily Beast that oh. sent an email. I want to be clear about this too to the listeners and to everybody. All right. Tim Mack contacted Hope Hicks. And he was writing an article about Donald Trump raping Ivana. Now, that's a real problem for me. Not because it's Donald Trump and Ivana Trump. I don't give a fuck about either of them right now. And, yeah. and even before, it didn't matter. It was the whole notion that he was going to be writing about something that he knew was not true. That even in the documents that he had, that Ivana, whose lang- English language is like the sixth, it's her sixth language. Her first, of course, being Czech. And then she speaks a half a dozen other languages. English is not really one of her strong suits. But even in the deposition that they took during the divorce trial, she stated emphatically that it's I'm not talking about rape in the physical sense. I was talking about it in the emotional sense. So I was explaining to Tim Mack that this was not a physical rape. And he knew that because he had the same document, but rather this was an emotional rape. And when I had said that you can't rape your wife, all right, I was really meaning you can't emotionally rape your wife. Basically, Ivana was trying to be her flamboyant, you know, type of self, making it wah, 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 cry for me, right? He emotionally raped me because he gave me no love and attention. Well, Donald Trump is incapable of giving love and attention, not just to her, but to his kids as well. So I try desperately to, I try desperately to get him to stop writing it. And not even because of Donald or Ivana. This is the truth. I didn't want the kids to have to go through that whole thing again, like they did during the New York Post when it was on the front cover for like, you know, a year straight. So let, let's clear this up now for a second here by the way, because I was under the impression that Ivana, in her book, originally wrote that he was angry that she recommended a doctor to put hair plugs in his head and that it was very, very painful. And so he, (laughs) he pulled, this is what I read, he pulled her hair and said, this is how it feels. This is how it feels, which was a very abusive thing to do. And uh, then he followed up possibly with it was a little bit of violence. That's what she originally had. And then she took it out for whatever reason. They paid her off or she decided not to tell that. What do you know about that story? Because I'm, I'm happy to hear the truth. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I've never seen Trump in that sort of a state. Um, I think he's actually, you know, he's a coward when it comes to that. I've never heard of or seen him act in a in a physical manner like that towards Melania and I wasn't around during those days oh, you with don't know. Ivana. Well, do you know but, that and that I absolutely the, don't know. But that was that but in what the I do know. Dep- deposition or not? Was it in I there? didn't have the full I didn't have the full deposition. Well, that's what I only this writer was probably talking about. No. No, right. what he was talking no no, but just it's important because um what he was talking about was the issue of and the front cover was going to read Donald Trump raped me in 1990, and that just was not true. And I tried to do everything I could to stop, you know, but to Michael, stop it. Michael, there are allegations by, I don't know, something like 29 women. And then there's E. Jean Carroll, who is alleging that he raped her in, in the dressing room at Saks. Was it Saks or uh, Bergdorf? I forget. And, and that's an allegation. And why do you say you didn't think he was that type of person? Apparently, because he I've is. Never, what, uh, no, what I said well, is I've many, never many seen him. Well, there are many women saying he is. I have never seen him act in that way. Now, well, he is a he, despicable human being. Way. But he's not going to act that way in front of you. If he's going to assault a woman in a dressing room at one of the department stores, you're not going to know about it. You're going to have to take her word for it, which is what she's fighting for. By the way, and I have never turned around and said that I don't believe her. 
But at the same point in time, I wasn't there. I didn't witness it. So when right. people question me about it, it's not fair for me to turn around and to go off of hearsay simply because I despise the man. It's just not it's just not fair. It's not hearsay. It's an allegation that has legs. Not by me, but not by me. If I say it, then it becomes hearsay, which is in legal definition. It's the truth. It's you know, it's out. It's secondhand information offered to prove right. the truth of the matter asserted herein. I wasn't there. I never witnessed it. Now, that's not to say that it didn't happen. I will never be the guy who comes out and said that Miss Carroll or any of them are lying. I won't do that. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I will I will be honest and say I never saw him act that way. I was never in that situation. And if I was, I would never have allowed it to happen. But I do want to turn around and, and say that I would argue, going back to this whole thing about the birther, that that's what propelled him to the White House. And it is something that I will have to deal with and make amends with for the rest of my life. Because as you said, I knew it was wrong and I tried to put a stop to it, but there was no stopping him once the media started feeding his fragile and insatiable ego. Barbara Walters was on The View one day and she looked at the camera and she said, Donald, you sound ridiculous. OK, that's one that's one individual. And, you know, you know that I know Barbara and I have the utmost of respect and love for that woman. I think she's an icon and I don't think anybody could ever replace who she is and no, what I, she's done in her, in her right. career. But but let's talk about other producers that knew that Trump equals ratings. And the more outrageous shit that he said, the better it was for their ratings. Now, one of the outlets where he found considerable airtime and a platform for his views at the time was actually on The View, right? Looking back on that time, do you guys regret having him on the show as a guest in that that helped to normalize him as a candidate because you have a widely popular show? Well, I have no control over who they book. I'm just a cog in the wheel there. It's not my show. You know, I, I had a show on HLN and I had Melania Trump on and that's on me that we invited her to sell her tacky jewelry. And uh, I asked her, I asked her if she believed that Obama was uh, was born in this country. And she said, no, he was born in Hawaii and he's not a citizen. And I said, oh, well, uh, you know, they have a different kind of birth certificate in Hawaii. But she didn't get that. She wouldn't she wouldn't back off. So she was a little birther also, that one, which a lot of people now know about her. She was no angel in any of this. And by the way, one other thing, which I'm digressing. I know you like to stay on, on the topic, but I like to move around. So... This reminds me of the time we had lunch together at Fred's. I mean, that was a conversation that went from left field to right field and right That's back right. to home plate. That's how I do. I am a free associate. I love it. But, you know, you said that he never loved his children. He never seems to love his children. He doesn't love his kids. I cannot stand when he goes, when he went out there on January 6th and he said, I love you to his supporters. I love you. Do you think he ever said I love you to those, those pathetic children of his? Those two boys who are just like, Daddy, love me, Daddy. And Ivanka is the favorite one, and that's a whole other story with her. But do you think he ever even told Tiffany that he loved her? I don't think so. The answer to that is an emphatic no. Very much like what I had said before, I had never seen him act in that type of manner or say those things. So therefore, I couldn't say that he never has, but I, I have never. And again, I was around him a lot. I never saw him act in a way that either my parents treated me or I treated my ch uh, that I treat my children. I mean, you know, I I don't understand it. But from what I understand, his father, Fred, never treated him that way either. He's hollow. He's like a hollow man. There's nothing in there. And and by the way, when he came on The View one time, um, he said that he I think this is a famous uh, clip uh, that if Ivanka was not his daughter, she's the exact kind of girl he'd go out with. And that has made the rounds, you know, out there. And I said, who are you, Woody Allen? And he actually laughed at that. I, he's a weird guy. He's a weird yeah, guy. Very, very weird. Now, let me ask you a question. Would Don Jr. or Ivanka ever be welcome on The View in the future? And if so, will there be steps taken to counter their more egregious lies? For example, that the of election course. was stolen or of other course. sorts of conspiratorial nonsense? On, Michael, all these people who allege that the, 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 that the election was stolen, they're scared to come on the show. You don't even see any of these Republicans on CNN. They won't show their face. So it's the same with these other kids, you know, although Ivanka wants to run for governor in Florida. So let's send her. What does she want to run for? Something. 
Yeah, Senator, uh, she wants yeah. to take Marco Rubio's seat. And yet you still see stupid Marco. It shouldn't oh. be little Marco. It should just be stupid fucking Marco, right? That's really what he is. I mean, you're sitting there and you're protecting the family of the person that wants to take your seat. Hey, dumbass, it's time to wake up, get off the fucking Trump train because it's poisonous. Look what's happened to me. If I'm not the best example why you should get the fuck off that train and run as fast as you can, stupid Marco, wake the fuck up. Michael, first of all, Marco uh, versus Ivanka, why trade a headache for an upset stomach? They're both idiots. But as far as you're concerned, if you had played your cards right, he would have pardoned you and you wouldn't have had to go to jail. So, well, I would have, I would have gone, I would have been um, first on that pardon list, but I wouldn't do it. I, I wouldn't do it. I, well, that's why I was we not like playing you. that that's game. That's why we like you and we forgive you, truthfully, because you didn't Thank do you. it. Thank you. Well, I, I wasn't taking his pardon. I wasn't interested in it, and I'm not interested in it today. I have my own habeas corpus right now, right before it's before Judge Kotal. And, yeah. um, you know, I also have, I'm in the process of ready to file an action against the government, against Trump for, and Bill Barr for violating my constitutional rights. I'm not done with them either. And here's the nice thing though. Rudy Giuliani attacked me. Look at the shit he's in. Donald Trump came after me. Look at the shit that he's in. It seems that all of these, all of these people that came after me, whether it's the Matt Getzes of the world or the Jim Jordans or the Mark Meadows, they're all going to see their own day of reckoning. I and so. I actually take, I take pleasure. I know it's not nice and you're not supposed to, <laughs> but I actually take pleasure in watching him with that fat fucking sulky face walking onto Marine One and then showing up over where basically there was nobody there. 200 yeah. of his employees that they brought in from like, the golf course or one of his other companies, fuck them. It's called schadenfreude, schadenfreude. And you're suffering from it right now. And I have a little of it too, because I do enjoy it. But not, you know what? It's time for us to move on from the rage and the anger and the schadenfreude. It's like, uh, all right, he lost. They're going down. We got Joe Biden. Thank God. We dodged this wonderful, we dodged it. We're a country again. We're Demo Democrats. We don't have to move to Canada. People are talking about moving out of the country. Another four years of this guy, we would have been like, like a third world country. So we, we're <laughs> out of it. So let's relax now and take a breath and maybe enjoy it a little bit. I call it karma boomerang. And um, karma's coming back to want to look at the end of the day. Had he offered a pardon, right? Or had he protected me and done yeah. the right thing? I, I never would have testified before Congress. And therefore, 18 different, 18 different investigations would never have been launched. So wait, you would have taken it? You would have taken the offer? If he, if he had... Early, early on? I, that before, first of all, he couldn't have pre-pardoned me at that point in time. But had he turned around and continued um, to protect me, uh, and so on. Yeah. I may not have, I may not have gone and testified, not the time that you all saw me, but I'm talking about the very beginning when I testified before both the House and the Senate Select Committees on Intelligence. By the way, nobody else did. Why, why would I have? Are you saying that if he was going to save your ass, you would still be on the Trump train? I wouldn't be on the Trump train, but I certainly would be in a different place than I am in now. I don't know how it would have. I won't lie and say that this was some you know, um, awakening that I had simply on my own. The awakening came as a result of being kicked in the balls, not once, twice, right? By going to prison for his dirty deeds. And then more so because I wanted to publish my book to be thrown back in prison a second time, right? By as retaliation. as right, Judge It, Hellerstein it wasn't it. fair. It wasn't fair. No, but no. I, I, you know, I think it's fantastic that you admit all this. That you admit that you were an asshole, that you were a jerk, and that you didn't have some kind of an epiphany, but that you uh, saved your ass, your own skin. I said it's, it's smart. That's it's a reality. That's the way it should be said. Good for you. Well, what that is, what that is, is that's truth. But at the same point in time, I was a pretty good person on the outside, outside of the office. I mean, I, I was believe part that. Of I believe that. You that have good, I'm sure you have a good marriage, good family, and you're a good guy. You're a nice Jewish boy from New York. Listen, I appreciate all that. And I appreciate that you're telling the truth about yourself. I really do. I don't see that very often. No, I don't see it at all, especially not with that group of grifters. But, Joy, going back to The View, on June 11th, there was an episode on The View that you had walked back calling Donald Trump a domestic terrorist. In light of what happened on January 6th, do you believe that description is now apt? Well, I would call him a seditionist, right? The, the desire to incite a riot. 
You know, I mean, he didn't actually do the terrorism, but he incited it. And that's that I guess you could call him a, a, a terrorist. I don't know. I mean, I call Timothy McVeigh a domestic terrorist. So on a scale of Donald Trump to Timothy McVeigh, a wide gulf there. So a seditionist. Yeah, you would call him a seditionist. Well, yeah. I would add that to my list of other things like a racist, you know, sexist, oh, yeah. misogynistic, well, xenophobic, homophobic. I don't know. I kind of like the term domestic terrorist for him. But, you know, many people have described feeling a sense of whiplash in how quickly Trump has disappeared. And that's what I was talking about at the beginning. Um, that's only because they took him off of Twitter. They took him off of Twitter, so he disappeared. If he had, if he was still on Twitter, he wouldn't have disappeared, Michael. That's why you need outside forces to control him, because he cannot control himself. But let's also let's also talk about the media, whether it's ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN, all of them. Every three seconds, it was breaking news. Trump this, Trump that, Trump this, Trump that. It was a 24-7 infomercial. Remember what Les Moonves of CBS said? Trump may be bad for America, but he's good for television. That's right. So everybody is complicit in, in propping him up. I'll, I'll go along with that. Right. Think of it this way. It's as if one day, you know, he held us all captive and then the next day he was gone and we were in the midst of a new America. Um, it felt really odd how quickly the pendulum can swing. Right. One second, he's basically capturing 24 seven of the new cycle and the next section. And not because of just Twitter and so on and whether it's media or the press. Right. Yeah. Discuss this with me. What's your thoughts on that? How quickly the pendulum swings on something like this? Well, you, you're talking about the news and the news has to keep talking about what's happening. And once he's out of sight, out of mind, they're not going to put him on the front page anymore. That's what. But that's my point. They took him off of Twitter. That's why he's not in the news. If he were tweeting, Wolf Blitzer would be mentioning it. I guarantee it. So that, you know, that that's the truth of it. And that's the way news works. Also, coronavirus, you know, is it's neck and neck with him, even even this past year. It was a lot about him and a lot about the virus. And part of the reason that he's out is because of the virus. What's really depressing to me in a way, and I, I think this is true, is that if it weren't for the virus, he might have won. He fucked that up so badly with his lying and his denial and his and his uh, just like, oh, it's all going to go away. His fantasy uh, world that he lives in. Uh, just to maintain power, because it wasn't even a fantasy world, because we know he said to Bob Woodward that he understood the severity of the disease. But because of all of his lying and, and all of that and the way he put Fauci in the background and Dr. Burke's poor girl, she's not very popular right now. He, that is the reason that he lost the election. Otherwise, they would have voted for him again. That's the country we live in. And it's really scary because I've said this many, many times. And what what I find to be the most incredible things that people our american citizens do not realize just how close we were very to close. losing our democracy i know you know as i watch now what's going on in russia over alexei navalny and we turn around and we see how putin called in the army they called in the gu the guards and they're basically beating these um these protesters these supporters of navalny and so in Trump's mind, I can tell you this, and this I know for a fact, Trump wants to know why this didn't happen for him here in America. Yeah. Why didn't these MAGA militia, right, why didn't they surround the entire capital and basically swarm it? Why is it that Putin is able to do it and he can't? Because truthfully, he doesn't want to be president. He wants to be a dictator. He wants to be... Yes king of the united states he wants to change the united states of america and the constitution that he and his grifting children should basically have a monarchy for all eternity because he legitimately believes that he's better than everybody that he, he you know he comes from some divine intervention he's really one fucked up human being i think he's mental he's a little mental but yeah i mean he actually never read the Constitution, I don't think. And I don't think he understands government at all. He didn't really understand government. He's as, he's as, as educated on it as a typical junior high school student, actually. So he didn't really understand. what He used every executive power he could use. He used anything that he could do to, to you know, have to, to, to exert power. And I love that Putin, Putin said that he was annoyed that the Americans were interfering in, his, in the rioting that's going on over there about Navalny. 
That is really rich since he, he interfered in our election and helped to get this asshole elected, if you recall. The, 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 well, the fact every you know when he was in Helsinki with Putin, and he did not believe the intelligence people against Putin. Well, Putin says it. I guess it's okay. But 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 but, but that should have been a tip off to the Republican Party that this guy was in bed with Putin. I mean, how many more things did they need to say? I really, really can't stand the Republican uh, leadership who, who looked the other way when he was saying that Putin was more more uh, believable and had more integrity than our own t- intel people. Don't you think that that was a kind of a tipping point for for America when that happened and they did not go up against him? Yeah, it was God. a tipping point from it was a tipping point for me because Donald Trump only uses like one of 20 different words. And do you remember I do remember exactly what Donald Trump said. He goes, "He strongly denied it." And I believed his strong denial. Right? What the fuck does that even mean? I strongly denied it. Right? I mean, either you deny it or you acknowledge it. What do you mean strongly? He throws in these adjectives like a third grader. Because I his, and, and then he'll tell you he's got a big brain. He's got the best words. Oh. I use the best words. You know, I, right, Kofifi. Anyway, I mean, it's just, it, it's so ridiculous. And, you know, the GOP have, they, they have a lot to answer for. Yep. It's funny, and I do thank you going back to, you know, your acknowledgement. I am trying to do better. I am trying to be better and to make amends with, as I always say, with my wife, my daughter, my son, and my country, right? Look, that's what this show and other shows like yours and, and you know, um, like I was I had last week on the guys from Midas, we will go after all of these people who care more about, as you said, their own jobs, their own job security and their power. We will go after all of them the same way that we discussed Donald Trump. We will talk about Mitch McConnell. We will talk about the Josh Hawley's, the Matt Getzes, the the Mark Meadows, the Jim Jordans. Could you imagine the Devin Nunes? Could you imagine those two fucking assholes end up getting the Medal of Freedom? Right? Seriously? For what? It's a joke. Of course it's a joke. They may as well take a garbage can and stick it around their neck. What about Rush Limbaugh? Come on. I worked with Rush Limbaugh. I know the guy. He's got no, he has no core of self either. You don't even know if they believe half the shit they talk about. I don't even know if they believe they it. They don't. They don't. Neither does Sean Hannity, who acknowledged to me that half the shit, it's, you know, this is what his audience likes to hear. But, you know, Joy, going they back there, they're going to money. Calls- they make a yeah, lot of money. Yeah, they sure do. Is it possible that Laura Ingram makes like $45 million a year? Is that possible? I, I don't. Th- it's possible. I know Sean makes into the 30s, so anything is possible. I don't get it. I don't get it. And by, the way, by the way, what happened to Maria Bartiromo? She, what is she? The, she? She's like a pot person, you know, like the invasion of the body snatchers. She used to be like the money honey, and she was like a normal girl. I saw her at parties out in the Hamptons. And now she's the biggest fascist defender of this asshole. What the hell what happened to her? What happened to her? She thought it financially it's lucrative. It's the same thing with Rudy Giuliani. It's all about the Benjamins. It's funny. I have no I have nothing like that in my in my life. I don't believe any of that. My God. Well, there have been calls from Joe Biden and others for unity. Now it's a term that means something different depending upon who is actually saying the word. Some want us to pardon Donald Trump and then just move on as if January 6th never happened. And others believe it to mean respecting the other side argument and not engaging in politics of destruction. In my mind, I don't know if unity is possible when more than half of this country still believes that the election was stolen and other conspiratorial nonsense. Well, there will be unity. There will be unity when these Republicans in Congress stand up and on television, go on Jake Tapper's show, on, on The View, on Wolf Blitz, all these shows, and say, we bought the lie. It was a lie. This is why, why today I had a, a, we, were just talking, we were talking about Katie Couric, who said that the Trump, these Trump supporters need to be deprogrammed. They have to be deprogrammed from the lying that started wherever it starts and just went to the top. And from the top to the bottom, the lying that went on on Fox TV, on on Breitbart, on Newsmax, all of these outlets, all of those lies people have been buying. So until you have the truth out there, there will be no reconciliation. No, there will be no unity. I don't care what they say. The Democrats have to come up with the unity. Let them come up and tell the truth. And then we will have some unity. 
in this country. I mean, did we not see the same thing, like, for example, with Megyn Kelly? I mean, she was like one of the staunchest advocates against, you know, Donald Trump is not just a as a presidential candidate, but also as a human being, uh, allegedly the way that he treated her and so yeah. on during the, the election. Then all of a sudden she's kissing his ass. I mean, it's like, what are you looking for? Another Fox job? Are you looking for a job on Trump News Network? I never saw anything like it. And I'll tell you, that is a sad case right there that you're describing, because here you have a really beautiful woman with a lot of money and a husband and a life and what have you. And she's selling her soul again. That's what happened to the honey money, too. You know, it didn't happen to Liz Cheney. Well, here's an interesting case. Liz Cheney, who I never could stand. I never liked her and I like a father the whole bit. But I give the woman credit for standing up for, cheap, for what was right, to say to her people, the election was legitimate. It was not stolen. That was a lie that they were telling you. And, you know, the 70 percent of Wyoming voted for Trump and she did that anyway. Now, that's a brave move. That's a brave move. Uh, uh, Megyn Kelly should watch, watch some of that and maybe learn something from her. And the money, honey, too. She better start watching all these people to see what it's like to go through life and actually make a choice to stand up for what is right so that you can look at yourself in the mirror the next day. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me because she's a she's a talented, you know, news reporter and so on. And when, you know, Fox was not involved with Trump, I mean, she was, I think, Fox's number one uh, yeah, rated yeah, show, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. And then now, just to watch how, as she digressed for the Benjamins, and she's willing to sell her soul. She to- has so many Benjamins already. She has a ton of money. They paid her off an enormous amount of money. How much money does she need? People, you know, that's the other thing. Donald Trump always was like about money, 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 as if he was never going to die. I think that he thought in his head that he was never going to die. He thought that he was like, you know, one of these Greek gods that they talk about in the literature about how they're just going to be, they're immortal because they've been touched by by God, like the kings, like King King Henry, uh, you know, the, Henry VIII, who believed he was anointed by God to be in that position. Even Elizabeth II believes that shit. So they're never going to die, these people. Isn't that interesting? I thought, I'm going to die. You're going to die. But not Donald Trump. He's not going to die. Because Donald Trump needs more and more and more money. And so does, apparently, Megan, Megan Kelly. Because she's not going to die either. Which is interesting because <laughs> Donald, doesn't, <laughs> Donald doesn't have nearly the amount of money that he tried to purport. That's obviously part of the whole DA and the... Let me ask you, why do you think he never wanted his tax returns out? What was the reason? Is it because he doesn't have the money or because he did have the money? He does not have the money. And his biggest fear is what is going to happen when the tax return is released. They're going to shred it for all of the improper tax deductions and um, all of the um, non-payments of in- on income that he classified in different ways and that will of course create a fraud penalty not to mention a tax evasion case so why in the world would you put some document out there that you know is going to have a deleterious effect upon you well here's something interesting too one of the things we got out of the trump years is that we see that there are things that were just kind of like i don't know norms they were kind of norms so you don't have to show your tax returns i thought that that would be a rule that was a law it's not a law there are other things like that, that he has exposed all of this underbelly of the problems with the government, with, with government that the founding fathers could never foresee. They could never foresee that this maniac would be in the in the office, you know. So they figured that there was gentlemen's agreements about certain things. Well, it's not gentlemen agree- gentlemen's agreements. It's 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 actually you can you don't have to do certain things, apparently. And you get away with it. The next sure. president should be required to show his tax returns. That should be written in the law. Don't you think so? I do. So, Joy, do you find it difficult now to listen to Megan McCain when she, supporting Trump voters in the wake of the riots? Because I know you guys had a tense exchange a few weeks back. How do you guys plan to handle politics moving forward? I mean, has anything changed in terms of trying to lower the temperature around political discussion as people are really exhausted and traumatized over the past few months? Yes, I agree with you. I would like to lower the temperature. I would like to get my sense of humor back, for, for example. You know, it's not that easy to do the show when I'm sitting in a room in my house and I can't really have a conversation with anybody because 
they can't hear me unless I have to raise my hand and then somebody can see that I want to say something and then maybe they'll come back to me. It's not the usual kind of show that it used to be where you had bantering going on. So what do you think somebody speaks? The next one, the next one, the next one. So I don't like this particular format. I think it's very restrictive and hard to do. But it's it's what we have at the moment. And as far as Megan and I are concerned, we totally disagree politically. But she loves Joe Biden and she claims she didn't vote for Trump. So, you know, we can meet over on that point. I, I don't. It's a job. It's my job. I, I, I could be sitting there with uh, Joseph Stalin. I guess I'd have to deal with it. Yeah, actually. But you see, you really don't have to deal with it because like the same option that I had, you don't have to take the job. Right. And you can put your foot down that I, I could not sit next to Stalin any more than I could sit next to Adolf Hitler and sit there and to discuss politics. Or Wait a minute. Can you sit next to Meghan McCain? Of course I could. you could. Of course I, I you could. could. And so yeah. can I. It's not the same thing as quitting the job, uh, Michael. Don't even go try to go there. It's not the same as what you did. <laughs> I have a platform. Oh, really? I have a platform. Every day for the past four years, I have veered not once against Donald Trump. I am against that man from the giddy app. From the minute he came down that escalator, and I have never gone in another direction. I can sleep at night. Can you? No, uh, I'm trying to. Okay. I, I try to. Uh, you okay. know, as I told you, each day I try to make amends and you know do what I can to you know right the wrongs that I did. But I seem to be unfortunately the only one that's trying to do that. I do want to ask you, though, as we're beginning to wrap up, on Friday's yeah. episode, you referred to Senators Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, two people that I find fucking disgraceful. I mean, I honestly would like to have them both thrown out of America, forgetting about the Senate. They both shouldn't even be citizens as enemies of the people. They really are. I believe the two of them have blood on their hands and that should not be, um, you know, they should not have been at the inauguration Um Discuss with me what measures of accountability that you believe lawmakers like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley should face. Well, you know, I don't really know what the what happens to people who do those kinds of things. I mean, if if I could, you know, have a magic wand, I just say get them both out of the Senate. They don't belong in those positions. You know, but they have things like censure. Uh, they have things like fire them, I guess, whatever they have to do to, to get them out, because I do believe that they contributed. They also are seditionists, along with Rudy Giuliani. So I don't believe they're patriotic. They're liars. Both of them are liars. And, uh, and there's Josh Hawley. It's interesting. He's got a degree from Yale and Harvard, and the other one's got a degree from Yale or Harvard. So it doesn't even matter that you have a lot of education. You're just a bad couple of guys, you know? I would rather stick with my uncle, uh, my uncle Tony, who never went to high school, than to talk to these two You assholes. know, the big problem, though, is government. It's, it's not supposed to be a resume on your education. It's supposed to be your patriotism to this country. Our founding fathers never anticipated um, that being a politician is going to be a profession. Right. It was supposed to be your civic duty. It's a calling. It should be a calling, shouldn't it? But that's how it was originally started, that it, you were not. supposed. To, I mean, you see guys sitting there who were in the Senate for like 45 years and so on. That to me is a profession. And it was never supposed to be this. It was supposed to be no different than being in part of the military or serving your country. Which, by the way, is temporary. Serving your country is temporary. At, at some point, you're out of the army, if, especially if there's a war, you know, and you survive the war, you go home to your regular life. These people have been in those positions. They're worse than these long civil service people who take a job at Social Security for the next 50 years, which is a great, which is a great gig for them. But why are you in politics for that amount, to, for that number of years? That I don't understand. They need term limits. They need term limits. Mitch McConnell should have been out of there by now. Sorry. By a long, a long time ago, a, a long, long time ago. And even worse than that is the whole notion that like federal court judges should be, you know, for life. That's the I whole know. problem. Everybody and like gets 40 complacent. years old or younger and they're going to be there forever. Just like this, uh, this Amy Comey uh, woman who just was, who just got into the Supreme Court. She's way too young. She's going to be there for 50 years, for God's sakes. It's ridiculous. Yeah, there appears to be no age. Not just the Supreme Court I'm talking about. I'm talking about the federal courts also. You know, the problem is that they end up having too much power. It's too much power in one person's hands with no no responsibility and there's no accountability. Now, you know, so, Joy, as we're wrapping up, you know, sort of, um, you know, the, the show here, I want to ask you, because this I ask of a lot of the 
a, a lot of my guests, and it's something that pains me and it confuses me because we all know that Donald Trump has left the building. He's gone. You know, he's off to Florida where he's not even wanted. But the problem is he created something that it's out of the box, right? It's out of Pandora's box. And that's Trumpism as an ideology, which is now remaining pervasive at a grassroots level of the GOP. How do you think that we counter this MAGA insanity moving forward? Because the insanity is getting worse by the day, even though Donald Trump has left the building. Yeah. What do we do? Well, we, we t- talked a little bit about the press and how the media has to start uh, you know, calling out the lies on a regular basis. The lies must not be left to stand. Um, I remember years ago, the uh, Ku Klux Klan lost a lot of its mojo when the um, when you know, legally they, they, they got them on uh, money law or something and they 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 went broke, basically. So that's one way, you know, so that would translate, I guess, to we're not going to support the, these companies. I'm not going to support these kinds of lies on Fox and on other outlets. Pull your advertisers if you have any and if you have the, the, the balls to do it. You know, that's another way to do it. And then you just have to clamp down on these people. You can't allow them to run amok and start, you know, a violent outbreaks. It's not, it's outrageous. They must be stopped. I think that you vote, you vote them out. There's a lot of different ways, but everybody has to do their part. There's a lot of different ways to do it. In, in, in what other ways? Uh, Cause I'm cu- I'm very, very curious. Well, I'm saying the me- the media has to call them out. The uh, advertisers have to pull out when there's uh, when there are lies being perpetrated on the American people on, uh, in, the, in the various media. Um, you have to starve these organizations financially. You have to vote their leaders out if they are in Congress. There are various ways to do it. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there are other ideas. Come up with a couple. Yeah, I, I, I really don't know, because this Trumpism, the cult of Trump, and this goes back to our earlier conversation, why didn't I leave? You know, I was, and I talked about it in my book, Disloyal, a lot. I was stuck into the cult of Donald Trump. Not just I. Clearly, many people have fallen into it. You know, it's like, it's like Jonestown. But it took for me to basically go to prison to get the hell out of that cult. And I'm a much happier person now that I'm away from it. And again, trying to make my, my amends with, you know, my wife, my daughter, my son, and my country. But it's not easy to break away because the, these people feed off of each other. Did you notice, like, for example, the shaman, right, the, in, who was wearing the bikini, and then you had this one guy who walked in, and they keep showing and panning him. He looked like he had, you know, the 12 miles stare coming out of real serious war. There was something really wrong going on as he's yelling into the air at the lights. He's yelling at the same people that are there kicking down the doors and breaking the glass, you know, inside the Capitol. And they're feeding off of each other. So whether or not Fox or MSNBC or CNN or any of the, you know, the television stations or the media, whether they start to pull away, that ideology is now grassroots. So my question really to you is, how do we hit the younger, the younger generation? How do we get those that are already indoctrinated into the Trump cult, into Trumpism? How do we undoctrinate them. You'd have to ask somebody who, who's an expert in deep programming in cults. What Donald Trump has shown is that it is possible to rile up the base in order to create this this hatred, this divisiveness, this you know yeah. underlying belly. Yeah, but of, he's not there anymore. Right. But what happens, Joy, when a smarter Donald Trump, a richer Donald Trump, a more sick and demented Donald Trump comes in next a more prepared donald trump then what do we do so well, i do really pre- believe you have a more prepared electorate also i mean we, we have people have memories i don't think that that's going to happen so fast we know the signs this guy josh hawley is that type of person i think you know who could probably but yes you know trump, trump the thing about trump that i observed was that he was like a singular sensation in a way you know he had a way about him of speaking to these people on their level that they liked you know and he he had a way of, of of like triggering triggering them. And I don't know. He had a talent, you know. Let's give it to him. He was an evil genius. <laughs> he he was. He had a way of doing that. And I don't think the Josh Hawleys and the Ted Cruzes of the world have that ability. So I'm, I don't think it's going to be so easy for a Yale graduate 
to fill the shoes of this guy because uh, Trump was just who he is. And there is no other like that, as far as I can tell. Well, let's at least hope so. And Joy, I want to thank you. It's so good to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. This was some wacky conversation, Michael, I'll tell you. Well, it's no different than our, again, our lunch conversations or my appearance there on your view show, right? Which was, which was all over the place as well. You're right. I didn't like, by the way, I didn't like that whole setup. Me here, you in one place, everybody sort of trying to, you know, get their two, their two seconds in, their questions in. It was, it was awful. So, you know, when, when this bullshit pandemic is finally resolved and it will be thanks to, you know, um, Thanks to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and coming up with a real plan, right, in order to vaccinate the country and do what we need to do. Um, you know, love to see you again. And, you know, maybe this time uh, Megan McCain will ask me a question that makes sense. I don't remember what happened there. Oi. Oi. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Be, ha- be good. Be, be happy. I'm trying. And now for today's Mayor Culpa. In the video of Marjorie Taylor Greene that is currently circulating, she harasses David Hogg, a teenage survivor of the Park Lane school shootings. It's a creepy document of an unhinged woman who felt that she had the right to stalk and harass Hogg based on his vocal advocacy for gun control in the wake of the shooting. She calls him a pawn of George Soros, claiming that he has been paid millions to advance some nebulous liberal cause. Green was so proud of this video, she put it on her YouTube channel. But when watching it unfold, you're witnessing what has become a sad paradigm within our culture. How deluded people like Green feel entitled, not just to hold and espouse ridiculous and unfounded opinions, but to accost people in public and demand answers for their version of the truth. Green was outraged that Hogg would not answer or acknowledge her, and that worse, he got to meet with senators and that she got to meet no one. Her argument makes no sense and is akin to watching one of those Karen videos where an angry shopper asks for the manager over and over again. But that perhaps is where we are right now as a society. The Karens are running amok and demanding answers for questions that have no basis. It truly is a disturbing world. And thanks for listening. Mea Culpa is brought to you by Audio Up, Midas Touch, and LSJ Media. And it's written and produced by Jimmy Jelinek. Executive producers are Jared Gustat, Jimmy Jelinek, myself, Michael Cohen, and Phil Alberstadt. Our editor is Lisa Orkin. It may be a new day politically, but nowadays the landscape is more confusing than ever. Donald Trump may have lost the battle for the presidency, but in many ways, Trumpism is winning the war on the state and local level. Maya Culpa is here to help guide you through the wilderness and keep you informed. And let's face it, we all want Trump, Rudy, and the rest of these seditious traitors to see justice. And folks, it's coming. So stay tuned as I guide you through the twists and turns of the criminal process that will ultimately see them behind bars. Maya Culpa, nothing but the truth. 